I'm Chris Grandy. Thanks again for joining me with another video. Love having you. Uh, if you like the video, you like my stuff, make sure to press the like button down below and also to subscribe, all right? So it'd be great to uh, and share with your friends. Today's video, I'm gonna cover a few things. One is it's uh, Medicare open enrollment. I'm gonna discuss that. Uh, number two, a slight market update. I'm gonna do more of it in a, uh, a separate video where I just, you know, I also discuss gold a little bit and some uh, economic factors and things that are they're all coming together at the same time. Third, little tip, a uh, few tips on disability insurance that may be helpful to you. So uh, stay tuned, we got some of this good stuff coming. Video is a little long. If you want to skip to different sections, I will have them broken down below the video. You can see what the time marks, um, especially if you go to the YouTube page of the video, I'll have the, uh, the uh, um, timetable below so you can tell you know which, which section starts at what time point and you can go right to that if that's what you're interested in. So thanks for watching guys and uh, uh, and uh, glad to have you so please enjoy the video. Let's roll with them. Number one uh, for your yourself, your parents or anyone you care about over the age of 65 it is Medicare's open enrollment period and uh, just wanted to let you guys know about that because it's the time where you could change your Medicare plan I suggest either if you have basic needs, you can call like your local senior center and talk to the social workers there, like in Medford, uh, it's Carlene Bonani, uh, or whatever town that you're in. If you have more complex needs, then uh, some of you know we have a Medicare expert on our team, Lindsay Quillen, uh, holds a master's in social work and she's a licensed social worker and did 11 years working for the state of Connecticut on helping people with Medicare and Medicaid. And in the last few years, she's been running her own consulting practice, helping people with Medicare issues. And that's anything from choosing the right Medicare plan, Medigap plan, Medicare Advantage plan, to uh, navigating all the Part D options to find a plan that best suits your uh, prescription needs. She also can help with, um, with uh, anytime you have a dispute with Medicare, because I know there's been a lot of cases in the past few years where uh, doctors or whoever have billed in have coded billing incorrectly and it's cost people more money than they should pay so uh, just stuff like that and and she's available for to visit annually to make sure that you know the plans that if they've changed are still best fit for you so recommend that one way or the other whether you go to your uh, local social worker or shine counselor at a senior center or you uh, contact us and talk to our expert you know get that done make sure that's uh, optimal and so that's one thing so Open enrollment, Medicare, be aware. Another update, thought we'd also, uh, later on, I'm, I'm gonna do a separate video on, on the financial markets, but uh, I tell you, you know, sometimes I watch them intraday, meaning in between what goes on during the day. And today, Janet Yellen was, was gonna give a speech and people were expecting different things. And uh, it's I've never seen such uh, schizophrenia in the markets. See, the problem is, and I'll just put this in a nutshell, what's going on, the problem is, is we've had an uptrend in the markets and everybody's afraid to sell. No one wants to miss out. Now you might make another 5% this year, you don't want to miss out on that. Um, uh, and plus you have this constant investing from index investors, which interestingly about index investing, the good thing about it is that it tends to do pretty well over time. The bad thing is, is you are, if you're dollar cost averaging, you buy more and more as the market goes up. So every time there's a crash, you, you, know, you make sure that you 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 know you, you you might have had some money in at the bottom where you've gained, but all that all that purchasing you've done over the over the time it rises up means that you end up just kind of going negative a lot. I I, I think a lot of people their average return over 10 years might be five or six percent, which stinks, but that's really what you can expect I think these days. But you have all these pressures pushing the market that so it's kind of holding up there. But on the other side, everybody knows that uh, you know that corporate profits are slow to declining and that interest rates, uh, even on the short-term basis, need to rise a little bit. And uh, so you have a lot of pressures and people just don't know what to do. So in, you know, intraday in the market, you see a lot of schizophrenia. Buy this, buy that, sell this, sell that. Same day, you know, things just plopping around like crazy. So I'll have a separate video with just some, uh, some market commentary on that so that, uh, you know, if those of you who are interested, I won't bore you if you're not in this video. This is a general update, but on that one I will, if those of you like details. I'll share that. Another topic I want to bring up is 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 gold and the gold market. You know we've done very well with that. It's a 
you know, gold has risen nicely since the beginning of the year and some gold stocks, including just the exchange traded fund for gold, up over 100% for the year. Uh, individual stocks like Pan Am Silver up 300%, uh, New Gold up, you know, uh, gosh, maybe 150%, 200%. It's just, so some of the individual stocks have done really well. And uh, so obviously they need, to, they need to take a breather. But I think the underlying trend and in, in, in that people realize is that let's say the Fed were to raise some rates, um, raise the rates a bit, because, you know, in my opinion, I've shared this in many videos, is that the market, the, the, the economy is so financialized. And I think a lot more of this economy has benefited from financial engineering than people care to admit. You know, for example, you know, real estate and auto sales and things like that. You know, the average car loan is, is, is now the longest it's been in history. It's somewhere over 72 months. I think it's 77 months. So people... And the reason that is is because cars are getting more expensive but people really aren't making that much more money and their bills are going up you know the average person I know you if you work and you're working in Silicon Valley and you've got a million dollars in stock options with your you know with uh, with some tech company that uh, you know you know you're doing better than the average person um, but uh, for the average person who doesn't get stock options and just is you know earning income and saving their their little pay raises are not keeping up with the increasing cost of health insurance uh, that people don't even pay attention to. I mean, how many of you who are working have seen your share of the health insurance premiums go up? At the same time, the benefits have kind of dropped. The deductibles are higher, the co-pays are higher, and the only thing they've kind of given you is, oh, now, you know, if you go to your uh, annual checkup, that's free. It doesn't cost you $25 anymore. whoop de doo now, but everything else costs a little bit more money. So I think that, uh, you know, the costs have gone up. So, for example, car loans are um, se over 72 months now. So therefore, if you take the average car, which you know maybe cost twenty-five thousand, even just a few years ago, now cost forty thousand, and those people are trying to uh, you know make those payments. How do you make the payment? You know, if the payment was three hundred a month and now it's four hundred a month, what's one way to fix that? Well, let's just extend the term a couple of years. So that's financial engineering. How do you do that? Well, you know, when 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 credit is easy and interest rates are low, you can pull off stuff like that. So uh, that's just an example of the financialization of the economy. There are demographic pressures underway that normally would be a boost to the economy. So, for example, you know, a lot of Gen Y, uh, you know, should be forming households, having children, buying all the necessary stuff. It's a, it's the largest, you know, because they're the kids of the baby boomers. It's a, you know, it's one, it's them and the baby boomers are the two largest parts of the population. So they should be giving more of a boost to the economy. But since a lot of them are stuck at home with mom and dad, and um, or their, you know, their jobs just don't pay enough for them to really like buy the house they want. Uh, to do things to form households, have kids, that's kind of slow. So, I mean, that is a positive uh, economic push from underneath, but at the same time, you know, we've, you know, instead of making houses more affordable, the Fed with their 0% interest rates for the last nine years, you know, uh, investors, everybody coming, the Chinese coming in like crazy, houses have shot up, so all these Gen Y who'd love to buy a home can't. Or well, they can buy in some crappy neighborhood. So, it's been good for people downsizing, not so good for upsizing. So, I feel that, uh, you know, if we have any issue, and I think because people are buying, you know, this whole thing where the people keep buying stocks and buying them, but, you know, they're not sure what to do, that any dislocation in the markets would cause a lot, a lot of problems. And I keep continuing this theme, but I do feel that, uh, you know, things are very precarious, and that because a lot, and also because I mentioned this, a lot of trading is done in an automated fashion, that it's sort of like 1987 where if we really got any kind of selling in the market underway the computers will come in and start selling like crazy and uh, then you'd have some serious downside momentum which I think you know if the Fed were to raise interest rates too much would also contribute to that and therefore uh, you know the, the what they're trying to do you know the reason they want to raise interest rates because they feel the economy is doing a little bit better they would probably negate that with with any kind of significant rise in interest rates so what I expect is I do expect them to increase interest rates slightly, maybe another 25 basis points, which is for, which is a, a financial speak for a quarter percent, uh, and 100 basis points would equal one percent, and uh, and so they may do that once or twice more, but the long long end rates are staying flat. So even though they're lo they're raising short term rates from zero to a quarter to a half, the long term rates, if you notice, mortgage rates are still at three and a half, three point six. They're not really rising. 
So you're getting this flattening of the yield curve, meaning like, uh, you know, typically in a natural yield curve, short-term rates should be lower and long-term rates should be higher. And uh, right now you're getting this kind of, you'll get this flattening where if short-term rates keep coming up, long-term rates don't go up, you get this flattening. That's, uh, not so, you know, may or may not be good for financial institutions like banks. Not so hot for banks, really. Uh, but uh, at least the short-term rates increasing will help some institutions. I've talked in other videos about insurance companies and the financial risk they face from higher interest rate, from lower, low interest rates. Banks do face risk from low interest rates, so it'll help some people, but I do think that since we're such a consumer-based economy, any increase in the borrowing cost for such a, uh, uh, for such stretched out people may, may not help much. So that's an issue. So uh, that's, that's, you know, that's something that we'll, you know, I'll continue to talk about. Another planning segment I'd like to talk with you guys about is uh, disability insurance. Just a few tips with that. Many of you are still working have disability insurance at work and the typical coverage is 60% of your income. That's pretty basic. Some companies provide that for free, some provide it at nominal cost. Um, there are reasons they can provide it so cheap, um, but uh, let me give you a few tips. One, you need to determine how much income you really need if you got disabled. If that 60% is not going to cut it, then you need to supplement that. Number two, so you can do that either at work or personally. Uh, I do like having some personal disability coverage because it allows you to have some portability. You know, a lot of people are changing jobs more often these days. It's good to have your own stuff that sticks with you. And believe me, from somebody who's had uh, has an interesting uh, uh, genetic defect, uh, if you can get insurance younger before they find any of these problems, you should get it. <laughs> For those of you who are young out there. Um, number two, if you do have group disability at work, a lot of times if work is paying for that um, and such, and, and you're, you're getting that pre-tax, then the rule of disability insurance is that if you pay with pre-tax premiums, the benefit's gonna be taxable. So in other words, if, if you see on your pay stub that disability uh, insurance premium is pre-tax, it's deductible from your income, if you got disabled, that 60% benefit will be taxable. The way to do that, and the way to fix that, which I think is a good thing to do, is to make that um, disability premium taxable. Tell your HR department, I wanna pay taxes on the disability premium that you guys pay for me. It would be a small, tiny, few dollar tax increase for you, but the benefit is that if you get disabled, that 60% benefit becomes tax free. And that's better. So first off, uh, you know, if you currently earn 100% of your income, you pay taxes on it, maybe you live off 80% of your income. So 60% tax free gets you a lot closer to the amount you need than, uh, than otherwise. So that's one. That's the second tip. So first thing is make sure you have enough disability income based on what you need to get to an analysis. Number two, make sure that uh, you know you're looking at um, what's your net. So you want your disability benefits ideally to be tax free if you can help it. Um, there are a few cases you may want to take a deduction, but that's probably more for a self-employed person and uh, under some unique circumstances. A third point, uh, and something I mentioned in a different video that I'll link below. But uh, I talked about catastrophic disability insurance. And for those of you who are, say, under age 55, this is an awesome benefit. It's basically a long-term care benefit attached to your disability policy and costs like pennies. Give you an example, at someone in their early 50s put, put a small disability policy on them, but for 300 extra bucks a year, added almost $6,000 a month of, of catastrophic benefit. That means if he gets disabled in a, um, uh, in, in a way that is uh, puts him in a long-term care situation. You know, you need long-term care, you need to be cared for. You know, disability can just simply be you can't do your work. If you're a dentist and you can no longer use your hands that well, you've lost control of your hands, fine, the fine work on your hands, you can't do dentistry anymore, you're disabled from your dentistry job, but you probably can walk around and, and you're not fully disabled. That would qualify you for your disability insurance if you can't do your dental work. But if you're laid up in a bed and you can't take care of yourself, then it's more of a long-term care situation. And you might need more money for that because you, your wife or husband may need to go hire a full-time caretaker for you. Or he may need to put you somewhere where people can take care of you. The catastrophic benefit comes in and pays in those situations. So you get your disability benefit plus the catastrophic. And I think 300 bucks a year for a 50-something year old to have $6,000 a month of benefit that will cover them all the way till age 65 makes a heck of a lot of sense. This would segue very well, this would allow a nice segue into long-term care insurance. Therefore, what that would allow you to do right now is if you're planning early and you have the money, you can buy 
long-term care insurance a lesser amount with an inflation adjustment and have that segue nicely. So three tips on disability insurance. One, make sure you have enough coverage based on what you really need. Don't just assume the 60% is going to cover it. Number two, look at the after-tax versus pre-tax benefit. 60% might be okay, but not if it's getting taxed. Number three, uh, look for an individual policy to supplement it for portability, but at the same time, I'll couple this with the, the catastrophic point. Add some catastrophic coverage. It's cheap, especially for young people, and really would save your spouse or your family a lot of agony if something really bad happened to you, plus gives you a lot more buying power to take care of yourself. So those are just a few tips on disability insurance that I thought I'd share with you today.